have for now. So uh, with, without further ado, I'm, I'm actually going to uh, introduce to you our, our speaker today, who's uh, we well accomplished, and, and uh, I'm, I'm just uh, astounded by all of the things that she's, she's actually done. Um, and uh, let me uh, read you some, of, here's my cheat sheet for her bio. Uh, so she's the, uh, she's the executive director of the New Zealand Astrobiology Network, which uh, actually in about a, a week's time, there's going to be the first Austro-Asia uh, astrobiology uh, meeting that's going to happen in Rot Rotorua, and, and uh, that's being coordinated and managed by, by Hanatina. Uh, she's also uh, the senior science communicator for the Museum of Wellington, the Space Place uh, at the uh, Carter Observatory. Uh, she also s uh, sits as a founding board member for, for several organi space organizations like Kiwi Space and the New Zealand Mars Society. Uh, she's the first Kiwi to lead a crew um, to the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah, so they do analogs of um, basically like how you would live on, on Mars. Uh, she's the producer of the first astrophotography uh, also magazine, which is now an online uh, website called Milky Way Kiwi. And uh, one of the most important, maybe uh, uh, interesting thing about Haritina is like, uh, you probably don't know anybody who uh, is, has, a, has an asteroid named after. So she, uh, asteroid 7101 is actually named uh, after Haritina. Uh, which is always pretty awesome. <laughs> like I would want to have destroyed. <laughs> so, I, I looked uh, it up earlier, and I think it's worth about five hundred trillion dollars. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, it. So, I'll mention this. <laughs> so, yeah, her expertise are in planetary protection, international security, and science communication. Uh, originally from Romania, please welcome Haritina. Thank you. <laughs> introduction. <laughs> I'm very happy to, to have the chance to be here tonight to talk to you about astrobiology, which is a subject that is very, very dear to my heart. And I had this amazing chance to, to be able to go around the world and do these things that I absolutely love. I love the stars. I love exploration. I used to be a science fiction nerd when I was a kid. I read everything I could lay my hands on. And I grew up with Captain Picard, you know, all, all that, all the geeky, nerdy things that you can imagine, that was me. And um, fortunately, I ended up here. Fortunately, I came here to this country that has the most amazing sky in, in the world. And I do believe that New Zealand has the best skies. In, in here, on this latitude, not just New Zealand, but on the latitude of 40 degrees-ish around south, is the only place on Earth where we can see the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, right above its zenith. So in July, August, you go outside and you look up and there is that galactic bulge and we look straight through the atmosphere and we look at those amazing stars. There are so many of them and less light pollution, right? Because we can see, still see the stars from, from Wellington, which is a capital city. And you wouldn't expect to see stars from a capital city. And also, that's the reason why Sophia, the space telescope, there is this very famous airplane, Sophia, that has a hole in it and a telescope poked in the hole. It comes here every year because it has direct sight to this universe. And being here is not just the stars. There, there's so many amazing things about New Zealand, which I actually didn't really start to appreciate until I started doing my Mars missions. But one of them is this astrobiology analog. New Zealand is one of the best places on earth for doing astrobiology analogs. And I have kind of like two presentations. One is about what is astrobiology in a nutshell, very, very short one. And that's the one that I'm going to start with. Now, everybody talks about rocket science, right? Everybody talks about rocket science. Everybody worries about that and to me astrobiology is kind of a soft space science right and I've been thinking about this analogy talking about rocket science in the context of space sciences is exactly as you would talk about your Ferrari when actually you're going to this amazing concert <laughs> right so astrobiology is this amazing concert that we're looking forward to is this amazing thing that we want to find out all these beautiful questions but all we could talk about is what vehicle are we like literally going to use to put us into space 
but there's more to that. So that's why I think, and I've been thinking about how, how am I going to explain astrobiology? Because it's quite a new discipline. And it's got three questions. So, so um, before that, uh, I, I think it's, it's this. I think it's a soft space sciences, right? Not like the hardware, hard space sciences, like the rocket engineer. So it's got three, three fundamental questions, right? Three ways in which you can split the world, astrobiology. And it was really good because I could make this wordplay <laughs> with it, <laughs> right? And so you have stars, you have biology, and you have this gentleman here at Picorus who is actually into philosophy and things. Because astrobiology is quite a philosophical discipline. So the first question of astrobiology is what is life? And I believe it or not, and I was surprised to understand this and to find out. Believe it or not, we have no idea how we ended up from stardust into life. We have no idea. Like people have hypotheses. There is RNA, there is DNA soup, there is primordial soup, all sorts of soup, right? Nothing is clear. We don't know yet. We, there, there's not a research to say, yeah, we could reproduce life in the lab. We created life just like it happened in the beginning of the, you know, five billion years ago here on Earth, whatever happened then. We don't know. And, you know, you think, surely these scientists, they might, not, might know what, what happened then, right? They don't. They don't. It's like, wow. So that's one question. What we do know for sure, as I was just saying before, what we do know for sure, we know that stars out there in the universe exploded. And in those explosions, in the supernovae, those created every single chemical element that we are made of, that we use here to survive, right? So that, that's something that we know for sure. And we see these explosions, we see them in galaxies far, far away. When these stars explode, they just lit up the whole, they're brighter than the entire galaxy that we're observing. These are the supernovae. And that's a remnant, this is the crab nebula, it's a remnant of one of these um, humanless explosions. It's a place where perhaps life is born. So these are the things that, that we know. Which leads to the second question of astrobiology, which is where do we find life? Where is it? Right? And that's again another question. It's a very, very good question because everybody has been wondering. Epicurus, he was talking about life and he was saying that surely there must be somewhere else in other worlds life and you know creatures that are similar to us which i think is amazing for someone so you know long ago to talk about life um, and said Shostak as well he's worrying about life and actually he's the only person i've met who gets paid i mean i like it. There, there's a lot of people at city who do that but he's the one that i know who gets paid to worry about that kind of stuff for, for real, to look for life. And he's coming here to New Zealand. We're bringing him here for the New Zealand Astrobiology Network conference, which is in two weeks. And he's going to be in Wellington as well, keeping on Carter Observatory talks. And there's a bunch of other people coming here. Actually, next week, there's going to be another um, talk organized by the Rotary Club with a couple of NASA people who are here also for the conference. So there, these, these are talks about this kind of stuff, which I think is going to be really amazing. So said will be at the observatory the week after the next one. He's a really great speaker. He yeah. is, isn't he? And he's, he's so got a radio well. show. He's yeah, he's just like fascinating to just watch and you just like <laughs> shut up and listen to what he's saying. Then he, he was there and he actually was the one who told me about the wall signal and he explained to me how fascinating that is and, and you know what happened. They, they found the signal and then they couldn't replicate it, they couldn't find anywhere. And obviously everybody started talking about what that could have been and everybody thought, oh, of course they were comets. Because everything you find in the universe that you can't explain, there must be, there must be comets, right? <laughs> Just as every time you find something and, and you know, they look like UFO, some people call them UFOs. So it's like, doesn't matter, it's Venus, it's a weather balloon, it's a cloud that's, you know, a UFO. That's exactly... Yeah, the reverse, the scientific explanation for these phenomena are, is um, uh, they blame it on comets. Then this is, this is an example, this is a very recent article that I read about this star. This is also known as the Tabby Star. You know how they put the Kepler into a part of the sky, they took pictures, and then they 
got collective intelligence and crowdsourcing and citizen science to look at these stars because apparently people have the best way of finding patterns. And they looked and they figured out that the light that comes from the star is kind of like weird because it varies, but it varies like in a really weird way. It varies during you know a long term and it varies during short term and like best explanation they had was other than aliens that's a, it's a bunch of comets <laughs> and of course <laughs> everybody can calculate the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence that might be out there in the universe this is the famous Drake equation which actually there is a picture of this at the SETI Institute and um, it's just like an amazing subject, right? Like to ask yourself about life, and it's like, surely there must be life out there. Surely there, there, you know. And, and so that's the the Drake equation. There must be. And then there's the Fermi paradox that says, yeah, but where is everyone? So that's what astrobiology is about. And the third question, which is my absolute favorite, is what's the future of humankind? And so many times I've been doing all these talks at the observatory and, you know, because people ask you, like, if, you, if they know you're in, you know, into astronomy and, and things like that, they, they ask you questions. And a lot of times people come to me and they say, well, yeah, but we're going to blow ourselves into pieces because there's going to be seriously something like a war or something and we're a destructive nation anyway and we're a destructive race and why should we go to Mars because we destroy the earth anyway and why should we do anything because we destroyed the earth anyway so this is kind of like late motif all the time I hear the same conversation over and over again and I don't believe this I believe that we can create our own future I believe that every single contribution you know from the fact that I'm recycling my my rubbish instead of just throwing it away to how we talk to people how we behave how we collaborate it's every single tiny little gesture that we have today can change our future tomorrow and for our kids and for their kids and I believe that humans are the most amazing creatures like to me I think we are absolutely amazing we we have this this way of finding out things to be curious to create to you know we do good things as well not just bad things like as a lot of people say and I think those of us who understand space and who understand the future and who who are in this business i think we have the obligation to just go there and talk to these kids to talk to these people and say no actually we can change the world we can create a better future we're not going to die we're going to stay alive i want my race to stay alive for as long as possible so that's why i love astrobiology so much because it gets people out of their nine to five zone from, from you know at work and you come home and you're tired and you like cook something and then you watch something on TV and then you go to bed so it drives them out of that thing and it makes them think about these big questions of life and I think every single person on earth should be thinking about these questions because you know why not I think we should so that's about astrobiology that's a very pretty picture in Antarctica, this is the Concordia base, is the European Space Agency base in there, and they do a lot of Mars analog research, and you know, it's like, yeah, could this be our life on Mars in the future? We would be living in habitats like this, but you know, it would be something that we would be doing rather than just stay here on Earth and worry that we're gonna blow ourselves apart without doing anything about it. And I'm sure you all know what this is. Anyone who doesn't know what this is? Doesn't or does? Who doesn't? Anyone who doesn't? Hey, so this is this is actually oh, okay. This is one of my absolute favorite pictures. It's called the pale blue dot. That's um, Earth through the the uh, rings of Saturn. Well, that, that's the make the remake of this one. This is the original one, 1992. Carl Sagan oh. Voyager turned the Voyager around and took a picture of Earth, and that's the original picture. And if you wonder what this is, apparently it's a thing on the microchip that didn't work properly. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can see that it's better in the sides here. It's, it's not dust or anything. Like, I mean, there's two, two variants, but one of them says not, it's just nothing. So, to, to conclude, this is astrobiology, that, that's who we are. Astrobiology is about this kind of things that never give up, never surrender, right? <laughs> Like in, uh, what's the name of that movie? 
Galaxy Quest. <laughs> um, but it's about our strive to understand, our strive to survive, our strive to to just be better than what we learned, I think, in at the end of the day. So so yeah, the three questions. This this is astrobiology and that's Carl Sagan again, because I really like Carl Sagan. I think he's done an amazing work. So this is the... Um, how much time do I have? Oh, you've got lots of time. Oh, okay, yeah. No. So this is about astrobiology, because I thought I can merge them together, but then this kind of like, it's stand, you know, stands on a side, and then the other presentation is about the conference, which is this one here. Right, so when New Zealand. So do you have any questions before we do that about astrobiology? Thank yes. you. I mean, one, one, one of your, uh, oh sorry, one of your headlines was, what is life? And, and li uh, there's another interpretation of this question, is how do you define life? I mean, uh, yeah. I don't think there's a That's part of single, it well. single accepted definition of how do you define life. No, that's why I have a quote there, it says, it's okay. not a gene, but not as you know it. That's a okay. Star Trek quote. Mm. Okay. <laughs> do, do you, yeah, yes? Um, I was just thinking about how you were talking about how there's a lot of pessimists that come up to you. Um, and usually what I hear is about climate change um, and environmental decay. Um, and I think astrobiology has some figures in that pie as well, but I'm actually not 100% sure. So what's your perspective on that? And what do you mean in figures and in which way? Like how to manage climate change um, and environmental decay that we're currently experiencing um, and making sure that you know, it doesn't happen too fast for us. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good question. I think astrobiology is, astrobiology is actually not a science, it's a disciplina, disciplinary thing. It's like an umbrella mm. that covers a lot of things and it covers geology, meteorology, water quality, anything. Anything that can help us learn about who we are, what we're doing here on Earth, how we find life on other planets, or or how we survive in the future. And so, yeah, in in that respect, I think astrobiology can inform by putting this into a context, into the big context, right? So it gives the big context. Say, okay, this is what we do. This is what we are doing to do all these greenhouse gases and things like that. Look what happened to Venus. <laughs> yeah, that's an example. Um, so yeah, I think I think we can use astrobiology for anything. I love it when I go to schools and I talk to kids, and and they're like so in love with space, like completely in love with space. They're like it doesn't matter what you tell them. I mean, like you can talk about a, a branch, right, a naked branch, and you say this is like for the space thing, whatever. Well, I had a project with them with the Ministry for Primary Industries where I used to work. Seeds in space, right? So these kids grew seeds that went on the International Space Station, stayed there for six months with the Japanese space agency, they send them back to us and we send them to schools around New Zealand and they grow seeds. They were like crazy about growing those seeds, right? Well, what's the difference between growing those seeds and growing just seeds, right? What is it? Because it's nothing. But it was like, for them, it was like, wow, that's so cool. So in putting that into, into that context, I think it's, yeah, it's just amazing that we have this opportunity and I think we should just take it. So, you, you have a... Uh, do astrobiology people um, talk to or pay attention to folks working on synthetic biology? Yeah, yeah, there is a lot of talk about that. And last time, last occurrence of the New Zealand, no, of the uh, astrobiology, I always get this, this name, it's such a long name, Astrobiology Australasia meeting was in Perth in 2016 and we had um, Rothschild. Rothschild. Rothschild? What's her name? Um, I can't remember. Rothschild. Rothschild or Rothschild? She's from NASA anyway, so she's one of the NASA scientists. Hello. Hi. Uh, mm -hmm. right. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and she was, sorry, and she was talking about um, synthetic biology, a lot of talk about synthetic biology. So I guess anything can be astrobiology if you put it in the context of answering these three questions. It doesn't matter what you do, you can call it astrobiology. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. I've, I've got a uh, devil's advocate question sure. uh, around the whole Fermi paradox, and I hope that this isn't too controversial. But I'm just interested in your personal opinion. Huh. Um, what do you make of the Two Stars Academy revelations from November last year onwards, um, and the leaked uh, video material out of the Pentagon from the F-18 Super Hornets that clearly show 
uh, vehicles travelling at speeds and g-forces which organic life couldn't sustain, uh, which has been proven to be um, real video footage, and a lot of government reports right now saying that um, they think they do have evidence of visitation. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's really interesting for the first time to see you know governments getting behind this. But um, some would argue the Philly paradox has already been answered. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know. I wish, I really hope there are aliens out there. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to send you some videos. <laughs> totally. I, I'm, I'm all for it. But like, yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical. I, I used to read all about aliens when I was a kid, Eric from Daniken. Like anything you can imagine that was written and I had access to it in Romania at the time I, I read. And I'm not a foreigner, I'm not a stranger in terms of UFO literature and things. But when I grew up, the more I started working for the government, I just couldn't find anything there that, you know, any report, anything. It's like, do you think it's like so likely to keep these things hidden? I don't know. I don't know. And I do not know. I do not know. So do you do anything about the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program? The American government under Obama funded to look for UFOs and it came back with positive results saying that they did find them? Uh, where is the report? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, sorry, I don't want to derail you, but interesting, interesting points. No, it's good. No, I don't know of my knowledge. I have no knowledge of any kind of extraterrestrial activity. I don't. Um, so yeah, so maybe there is. I hope they are out there, and I hope they're coming. Maybe we can probe them. Yeah. yeah. Personally, I found that a lot of those kind of um, claims, at least, are usually explained by drones. Or comments. Yeah. Or comments. <laughs> or comments. Yeah. <laughs> comments. <laughs> the way should explain either drones or comments or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of the argument that uh, if if there is biological life anywhere that will uh, put the atmosphere out of uh, chemical uh, balance. Uh, I mean, based on the uh, yeah. sort of one, that's what we have on Earth. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, so uh, based on this argument, there's no life on Mars. Totally. Uh, like end, so of the, end of the story. So the first mass extinction. No. No, no they detected methane emissions on Mars. That's yeah, recently. Brought the, the argument back that the voyage of Mars ah, okay. was right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, there's still a lot of argument about that. All right. Yeah. Okay. They um. Oh, sorry, this is my uh, partner uh, who we, was supposed we know to come the here. natural mechanisms that can produce many things. So yeah, that's why they still argue. Yeah. <laughs> I've never done this ever in any of my talks, texting my partner to come and where to come and pick me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jerry. This is very kind of you. I'll tell him. Um, the first mass extinction that we know of, it's when these microorganisms that formed on early Earth poisoned the atmosphere. And guess what they've done? Oxygen. And, and they completely destroyed. Like, that, that was the first mass extinction. We can see these in the bands, the iron bands. I've got a tiny little piece of that rock. I should have brought it with me. It's a tiny little piece of red rock with bands in it, iron bands. It's amazing. Like, you look at that. It's like, oh my god, that happened three billion years ago. Things died. And then those are our ancestors, right? From <laughs> that thing that poisoned you. So it's very, um, it's very likely that when life starts, things are changing. And also, life actually. And, and the other thing that it kind of puzzles me is the fact that. We had undergone through so many mass extinctions, right? Like five, six mass extinctions, right? For us to exist. How likely is that, right? You've got trilobites, they die. You've got these microorganisms, they die. Some tiny little survives. It's almost like antibiotic resistance. If anyone here knows about antibiotic resistance, and this is a really huge issue now in, the, in this um, health world. And, and we're worried about that. It's exactly like, you know, in a way, kind of like that. <laughs> How many things had to happen? Dinosaurs had to die so that we are here on Earth, right? We, we evolved. We weren't, I mean, I don't think we were planted here. That's what I believe, right? I mean, you can say whatever. <laughs> but, yeah, so. Anyone else has a question? No. Yeah? Um, 
do astrobiology people keep an eye on um, you know dangers to life on Earth? Uh, one thing I'm getting at is you know I, I think they're starting to say the Earth's magnetic field starting to get to get a bit erratic. No, there was this switch that's apparently overdue. Yeah. yeah, yes, and I've, I've, I've been to this conference a couple of years ago, and there was one of the presenters there. Actually, she works in France, and France has a really amazing part that works exactly with the magnetic field, and they're saying that every so often, a few thousands of years, or I think 20,000, I can't remember the, the, the number exactly. It's a bit like the Alpine fault, you know, we're due, apparently. Just flips, mm. yeah. So that could be bad. No, because we've had at least 20,000 events of it. Yeah. If it was going to kill life on Earth, it would have done it yeah. already. Well, oh no, it's bad in the sense that it will might be some electronics, so it misses some power and power systems. I bet. Yeah. Well, coming <laughs> from the other hemisphere and learning how to live here, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, also, would we survive it? Well, yes. Probably, yes. I mean, as long as the magnetic field uh, remains, you're safe. Yeah. You could just flip it, but it could remain. So. Okay, that's, that's what sort of that's what period. Yeah, it'll drop for a while, so you get a high level of radiation. Anyway, do astrobiology people keep a check on that kind of thing? Yeah, we do. And so, so yes, we do. And there are people who look also at, um, there's planetary protection, there's planetary defense. So asteroid threat goes into the planetary defense bucket. There is a lot of uh, interest from, from, from the US government. They, they've actually been at the forefront of the planetary defense and there were this guy who put together the hypothesis for the asteroid that hit Earth and I can't remember his name right now. He is the one who actually initiated the planetary defense program. He's the one who made US government worry about having a planetary defense program to watch for asteroids that are coming towards Earth. We just hope that Heratina won't hit us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's and five kilometers across. It is. It's, <laughs> and it's quite far away. <laughs> the point I always liked from him was that the difference between us and the dinosaurs is we have a space program. <laughs> do something about it. Yeah, we could, that, that's, that's a very, very good observation. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. So we can, that's what I'm saying. We can do in collective, we can do something about anything. If we could do something about that, we could do something about surely about the future of humankind altogether. Yeah. Yeah. Should I continue with this? Right, so New Zealand. I'm very passionate about the stars in New Zealand. I think they're, they're absolutely amazing. But as I was saying to you before, I think there's so much more to New Zealand than the stars. So that's, that's uh, kind of my repetition of what I said before. Astrobiology is the study of the potential of, uh, this is the scientific uh, definition. What I showed you before is the lay people's definition. So in, in the science, that's, what, um, that's how they rephrase it. So it's, a, it's an interdisciplinary subject. It uses all these sciences. The same sciences as we use in day-to-day -day life, but they just have a, an astrobiology flair. And so these three questions that are, are, um, are being answered, right? And the thing about astrobiology that I thought another thing that is absolutely amazing to take home with is that everything we do contributes to the knowledge of the people here on Earth. It's just like, you know, I've been often asked, like, oh, yeah, why should we go to space? Why should we spend money to go to space? Why should we spend all these money in space, right? And I've asked back, I said, I seriously, uh, those people who work in space, do they get paid in space? Like, those money just, like, float in space out there and, and just in the, you know, vacuum of space? Or do they go on banks on Earth? Right? And, and then transform all these space spin-offs. You know about space spin-offs, right? How amazing they are. How much they change the life of people here on Earth, right? But that's, it's people need information. If people had more information, and I, again, I think our duty is to go there and tell people what we know so that together we can make better decisions. People nowadays, they love being involved in any kind of conversations. I um, did a lot of risk communication when I was working for the Ministry for Primary Industries because I was a, a biosecurity risk analyst. And even if you do a law, like you have 
an import health standard, right? Someone wants to import cows from America, and you have to do a analysis of what can happen if you import cows from America. I'm just giving you an example off the top of my head, right? I had a gecko. I was working on a on a gecko thing, and I had to. Someone smuggled geckos from from New Zealand to Germany, and then the government brought them back. And I was the one assigned to work on that project to say what can happen if we bring them back and we release them in the wild. And we couldn't actually on Somes Island because they could have brought disease back. And so you had to do all this analysis, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, what was I saying about that? I can't remember. But I was saying about New Zealand and how complex these these things are and how much value uh, the, the work that we do for space research brings back here on Earth and, and that we can keep on top of it. Oh yeah, I was talking about science communication, right? So, and, and risk communication. And so those people who actually, we, we put a law out there for the people to obey, right? You have to leave your diseases away from New Zealand. You just leave them at the border. And guess what? People argue. They're like, oh no, we have proof that there is something else. People want to be engaged in that conversation. Even if you come with a scientific proof, people will still argue. So they want to know that even though you've made this decision, they are involved. So even in matters that kind of like shouldn't matter, they should be like, yeah, okay, guys, you know better because you're the scientist. No, people will still argue. They will still come back. They will still say, no, nah, we want to see the evidence. We want to see the proof, right? So that's the new way of communication. It's a two-way conversation with everyone in every single aspect of, of our lives. And I think it's an awesome thing, right? Because like we're in control, we know what we're doing. But in order to have a collaborative, in order to have a constructive way of dealing with these things, we need to, our duty is to inform these people, get them there to have information, to have access to this information so they make the best decisions you make the best decisions when you have most information, right? And you don't make good decisions when you don't have information. So, back to my presentation. I quite love this picture because I always think, right, so what's New Zealand? And it's not me. I've always been asked, why is New Zealand? New Zealand has nothing to do with space, right? Why should we do space in New Zealand? We shouldn't do space in New Zealand. It's a waste of time. This is me being a planetarium presenter working in, you know, doing space talks and things. and. I always said to them, yeah, no, actually, New Zealand has such a varied environment that if you look at all these places in the solar system, just, these are just moons, right, where you might be able to find life in there, all these places, um, there must be something in New Zealand, there, there's got to be some place in New Zealand where you can use that knowledge as an analog for all these places in the solar system where we look for life, to understand even how life might form. So that's why New Zealand is so so awesome, and that's what people kind of like start to, starting they're starting warming up to this idea, you know. Oh, actually, oh, okay, maybe we can do we can do um, um, space in New Zealand. This is one of my favorite maps. Obviously, there is places that are analog everywhere, all over the world, right? Everybody in here has extreme conditions. There are people who study external fast in the desert. There is Antarctica, which New Zealand has a stake in. There, are, there's Australia, right? First life, kind of like in there, they discovered first life on, on land. They try to understand there is South Africa as well. They plan to, to know about first life on land and, and things like that. So all these places are all over the world, but New Zealand is one of them, which is why it's at the center of the map. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what do we have? We have these islands, volcanic islands, right? And these are very important, and I'll tell you in a, in a few slides why these are very important. This is actually fundamental. It's a, this has been this huge discovery that was published in Nature last year that is, has been done because of Rotorua and because of the volcanoes, and I think this is amazing stuff that happened. Then we have small expeditions experience. We have Maori navigated by the stairs and small crews. Captain Cook came here for the same reason in small crew. So we have all this small crew, which is the same thing is, you know, what happens when you send people to space, you know, you're not going to send the whole CD for now, well, <laughs> not yet at least, but you can actually take from that experience and, and see lessons learned for everybody. There is a program in Antarctica that's already doing that, you know, they measure stress 
different things. I've been to my Mars Desert Research Station missions. It was like the best thing ever, the best thing ever that I have ever done. You go there, there is a, a place that looks just like Mars, and you stay there for, it's two weeks for a for, for mission, and I've done four missions. And you go there with six people, and there is nothing, it's like for, I, mean, I think you drive half a day to get to a hospital, so that it's very, very um, far away from any signs of civilization. There is a thing called Hanksville, um, like a few kilometers by, and someone actually made a, a t-shirt that was where the hell is Hanksville. That's how, you know, in the middle of nowhere it is. In Utah, you can imagine, and the place looks like Mars. It's red, and it's got all these hues, and it's absolutely amazing. And we got there, and that was my most amazing experience because I realized how hard it is to play astronauts, how hard it is to play Martians. So I, me, who I'm working, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a applied scientist, I'm an engineer actually. I work in the government, I don't really do space missions. I go there and you have to plan everything. You have to be psychologically trained to withstand stress. Like the first three days in every single mission that I've participated in there, we were fighting. Right? And it didn't matter. It didn't matter if I went with the Romanian crew, with the Kiwi crew, with the Australian crew, it doesn't matter. Everybody was like grumpy, very tired. And then I realized when you're absolutely tired, you're like dead tired, you kind of like lose your plot. Right? So these kind of things that might not, you know, you don't know about them unless you've been in that environment. That's the kind of stuff that we're, we're, we're learning from these kind of expeditions. Because they must have been tired as well, right, when they were traveling. They, they know there's this new waka revival thing now in, in New Zealand and these people they just hop on a waka and travel the ocean I think this is awesome that's we want to do with um, um, Yvonne we want to do a research how can Maori navigators can actually share their experience with astronauts training programs and with navigating by the stars astronauts Yvonne Kega was saying, she was here this year and last year, she was saying that astronauts navigate by pairs of stars, and we were like, yeah, well, that's how Mari navigate by pairs of stars. So there's all this synergy that we can learn from, from all this culture, from everything that has ever been in New Zealand. And also, of course, there is the geology of New Zealand, and it's got amazing places that are completely dead, right? Like, very poisonous. New Zealand, most of the places in the old volcanoes are very poisonous. They have all these gases and sulfur and things, and you'll think there is no life in there, and the reality is that there is life in there, right? And we call that life external files. That, uh, that's a very good example of it. This is us, and we took these kids, and we went to, to Rotorua. We did this expe expedition in 2015 and 16 called Space for Bound, which we made it from um, the model of, um, of a NASA ex expedition, where you have teachers and students take them on the field and let them there for like a, a week and then see what happens and what ideas they come up with. And it was absolutely amazing. And we, we actually looked at all this zone in here, the TBZ zone. And what happened, um, there was a project in there that was um, looking at external files and was studying, was classifying. We have so many life forms here in New Zealand. You know, there is a EPA, um, Environmental Protection Agency, they have so many forms to fill because they find new species every day almost in, in those uh, hot springs there in Rotorua. And then of course there is this community, which this is a completely different community, all these astronomers, we have the MOA telescope in Mount John. And they, they were doing a lot of micro lensing and then Graham Murray, he was telling me that they were looking for micro black holes, so the Japanese who are actually have paid for this, they're looking for micro black holes, which I thought was like, yeah, a little bit like alien style things, but really amazing. And they, there are a lot, there are a lot of astronomers here in New Zealand. I've been working with them since 2005, and um, they're everywhere, absolutely everywhere. But nobody kind of talks about them because they don't like to talk to people. <laughs> you have to seek them out. Yeah, you have to seek them out. And I think that's the problem. And then we have the squad base, right? What an amazing analog field for cold environments, right? Like you would find on Mars. And then we have this thing, we have the space tracking. And apparently New Zealand is an amazing place to put a thing to track satellites through space because we can see it very, very 
easily that's what I've been told and yeah of course we have the New Zealand Space Agency that um, was formed in April 2016 yay that's really awesome because now finally we can say yeah actually New Zealand does have a space agency even though it's about Ferraris and things but it doesn't matter because like, we could use the Ferrari image to say yeah we could do astrobiology on a site look at us we've been doing it anyway for all these years so that's a bit of, um, we're a bit legitimate now because we have a space agency. So if the government says that maybe we should have a space agency, then maybe we can do space in New Zealand, which is good. And then it's us, the New Zealand Astrobiology Network. And this has been like the hardest work I've ever done because <laughs> um, we try to make a community around the scientists in New Zealand. And you can imagine that was exactly like herding cats and still is but we, we don't give up. So one thing that we said we were gonna do in order to get them to collaborate, and that kind of like, they, they really liked it and they warmed up to the idea, because we said, okay, you're, you're there in your universities and you wanna teach this to your students, right? And then your students come back and um, they say, oh yeah, but we don't have works places, work places in, in space. We don't do space in New Zealand, right? So that's, um, Emily is gonna come and talk about this at our conference. And they say, why should we study space? Because there is no nowhere to go in New Zealand. And you know, maybe some people can get to NASA, but not too many people. And what we said, we said we can make spaces and work and, and things like that for people if we work together. But we have to start at the education level. We have to start with the kids. We have to start with the teachers who are teaching space and say, hey, you guys, you know what? Actually, the future is in the space industry we can make this together but the starting point that we thought and it struck the chord with these people who are teaching at university who would like to do ast astrobiology but they can't because they don't have the intake of students is to start there so that's what we do we have um teachers workshop in there and we're trying to bring resources from nasa and from the european space agency about astrobiology for the teachers and say, hey, you can teach your science, you can teach your biology, mathematics. There is an awesome mathematics resource for astrobiology that is from, from NASA developed. Just purely mathematics for astrobiology. How cool is that? So the kids are like, ah, oh, yeah, we're working on problems of space. But actually the same mathematics that you do with theoretical stuff that it might be boring. Um, so the biggest problem that I had, right? The biggest problem I had, if people were in silos, all these people in silos who didn't want to talk to each other because they don't talk to each other because they're from different disciplines. So that's what Astrobiology Network tried to do, kind of like give them a common purpose, a common sense, and then say, okay, you can help us do this curriculum for kids in the schools, make resources for them, and then we work together, and then you have your place at university if you want to teach this at you know a, a very high level. So what we're focusing on is research, education, and community, kind of like combined. Research and education, meh, not that big because, you know, they're undergoing, but I think the, the what's gonna make this work would be to make this known, to bring it to the community, say, hey, this is your inspirational point. This is your, this is where you can learn about space, basically, space sciences, and, and like the common denominator, it's, it's this one here. And then what you do with it, um, Emily is going, is going to come in and tell us all about it. What do we do with the space industry now that we're thinking about it? So, yeah, so what we did uh, physically, we, we did these two expeditions. We did Space Rebound uh, 2015 and 2016, and we, I took them to the Mariah. We slept on the floor. It was amazing. Everybody loved it. Um, we had an outbreak. It was like exactly like everything that went wrong went wrong and I could have gone on with wrong. It was, it was just, it was a good experience on and on. And um, it was so good that we came back next year with these kids that were from the tribe there. And what we did, we applied the Mataranga Maori system. So this the Maori way of learning to space. And we said, okay, there is a parallel between your story of creation and there is a parallel between that and, and the Big Bang story. And this is how they combine and this is where we think how how can we explain the big bang with with maori knowledge and they're like oh yeah we get this so that was really successful because that kind of like opened up the way into different communities and, and 
um, especially in that in Rotorua because we want people from Rotorua to be happy that we're going there to study their stuff because most of the times they're not happy that we're going there to study their stuff so we explain this is what's happened this is the purpose that's why we're doing all this thing and you know like if you think about it Maori culture is from you know compared to other cultures like compared to my um, culture if you wish in a way is very scientific this is what I've I've learned from from it and uh, you, you can talk you can ration with with you know in that kind of part of uh, of the conversation you can say this is how things translate and, and they, they get it because they have what Maori culture has which is very good for astrobiology is whakapapa whakapapa means genealogy so they always say oh we're tracing our origin from bacteria we're tracing our origin from an iowa tree we're tracing our origin from this lizard which is not untrue right in the grand scheme of things you can explain it with it said they, they looked at the rocks in Pilbara and they said nah these rocks actually this is not a marine environment that's what they've done and that was because they came together and they talked together that was during space for about 2015 and they said that's not a marine environment this is a terrestrial environment and there is this rock called geyserite that is in New Zealand it's a new rock but it's exactly the same as the rock from Pilbara that is from three billion years ago so they came back to New Zealand they looked at that rock that's why New Zealand is such an amazing analog place because um, at the time people thought that life originated on land later so they pushed the origin of life on land back with 500 million years which is a big deal i'm told i mean it is a big deal right <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah so that's what happened because they came here in new zealand and because they got together and because they talked to each other because they didn't want to talk to each other because they were like oh no we're working on this institution here and we don't talk to other people other than conferences where we're going to fight these wars or in papers or in uh, you know posters but yeah so here's for networking and so after that we're doing this the conference and uh, obviously the program is now we have about 80 participants but we can take more if anyone is interested or if you know anyone who's interested it's in two weeks time and that's the kind of stuff that is going to be presented for the first time in New Zealand and again I'm like so proud this is happening I'm so excited I'm so looking forward to see all these people not necessarily because I'm like this is amazing science but like just getting there and knowing each other and saying hey we're doing the kind of same stuff we're in the same boat we, we, we're working for this amazing thing to take humanity forward this is what we found out and that's that's what's gonna happen and of course we're gonna have set so yeah that's the end of my um presentation that's the mighty poster and um yeah thanks for listening <laughs> thank you so much. any more questions for other people yeah. how much the conference i think it's about 500 dollars for two days yeah we'll try to keep prices down and you know have, yeah, did a lot of volunteering work and stuff. If I googled the um, network, would that come up, or is that the yeah? This is the network. That's about oh, yeah. it. That's us. Oh yeah. Uh, what I'm still thinking about, I'm not really sure how I'm going to, because um, a lot of people ask and they said, oh, we want to be members for this, or we want to. So I'm not really sure about the governance. What we are now. Is there a forum or something on there? At least where people could like participate. Um, I'm thinking of making a, a page on, on Facebook, but mm. I'm not really sure. And again, I've been thinking, what's the best way? And I, I don't know the answer. What's the best way to <coughs> tell people that we can engage with them? You know, And the New Zealand Astrobiology Network is a charitable trust, so we can apply for funds and we can do all these um, research things. But then what do you charge people a fee per year? I don't like this. Like, I don't like charging people fees because I don't believe in it. You know, but yeah. You can be a community within Space Base. <laughs> we could. Could we use your platform to yes, talk? Yes, sure, of course. Know? How can we do that? Oh, you just create an, uh, an organization on the platform uh, and it, it already has like forums and you can put resources and you have on members there in the group. and you can okay. get members on the group as so, well. So that, okay, yeah. that, okay, all right. Do that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go then. <laughs> <laughs>
It's the uh, rover presentation next Wednesday, Wednesday I think. Uh, yeah, so these are uh, Mitch Schulte and Lindsay Hayes from, uh, from NASA, they're coming here. Lindsay is second in command, I think, for astrobiology studies at NASA in Washington at the headquarters. And Mitch is the scientist, chief scientist for the 2020 rover. And we are bringing them here on, I think it's, yeah, it's on Wednesday, it's on the 20th. Yeah, exactly it's on the, the 20th. Same, exactly the same time as the GovTech. Oh, that's ro Rotary Club. That's the Rotary Club. They organized it. Blame, blame it on them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I tried to reason with them, but they didn't. <laughs> well, like, no, we can only do this time, so. Yeah. I don't know. It'll be interesting just because I saw recent news as only a few days ago. One of the rovers on Mars got stuck. Oh, they I get stuck all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen they got it unstuck yet though. <laughs> right. No, no, they, they there's a massive dust storm. Dust storm. Yeah. Oh, was that? So now yeah. It's like, it's a, yeah. Now it's really it's, stuck. Yeah. It's really so stuck. they're they're yeah they're waiting. Uh, it's uh, it's supposed to only wake up every day and see uh, see if it can you know send out one ping uh, message, but uh, it missed its ping, so oh, okay. they're a little worried about it. Yeah. Which one is that? The uh, opportunity. Yeah. Oh, it, okay, but the, yeah. the 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 dust storm is spreading. It looks like it's going to go global. Oh, yeah, That's and so so uh, all the other so uh, curiosity could be affected too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I guess I have another question, which is sort of sorry related okay. to um, your whole relating rocket science to Ferraris. And I just came up with this like yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to explain <laughs> to like oh, no, oh, but it, it's sort of related though. Don't get me wrong. It's um, how at least I've seen. Uh, spread around is that more and more um, space research agencies are trying to move away from rockets and jets. Mm. Um, does astrobiology, I suppose, have, a, have anything to do with that? I don't think so. I think they just understand it. Astrobiology, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. NASA has a uh, um, NASA Astrobiology Institute. And kind of I think what they've done with astrobiology, they try to say, okay, we have rockets and then we have everything else about space. What should we call it? So it's kind of everything is invented. It's a process, a process of institutionalization of, of space. I did my uh, my master's thesis on the institutionalization of space, and I looked at because my my um, um, supervisor she came to me one day. So I said I want to do space, and I, I did a master's in international research and intelligence, international security and in intelligence. And she said, what do you want to write about? And I thought about it. I said, no, I really want to do space because I love space. It's like <laughs> I couldn't bear doing research on anything else. So she said, yeah, fine. She said, tell me why we didn't go back to the moon. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a good question. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So, so then when we were going to the moon, we went to the moon with war, right? But then war stopped, but we still did space. And I looked at why is that? And the reason why we still have space is because space became institutionalized as a thing that you do even when it's peace. And institutionalization means to put rules and things around something that you do anyways, like marriage, right? You don't have to be married, but if you are, here is what happens, and here is good and here is bad, right? You don't have to drive on the left-hand side of the road. That's another example of an institution. But if you don't, then you can get a collision on. Yeah, so. I don't know, but I think this is part of the institutionalization process, right? So someone came and put a label on it and said astrobiology. And I think it's a cool thing to do, right? It's, it's awesome too. Because then once you have a label, once you have a structure, then you can put a strategy around it, you can talk about it in a different, you know, like in a organized way. And um, in, in the institution's book, someone said, like, if you want to get things done, create an organization. It doesn't matter what it is. So, which is why, actually, I've, I've done this after I finished my, my master's thesis. And I said, I have to do something that it's an organization that is actually an entity, a legal entity, because that's how things are going to get done. Otherwise, if you volunteer and things, nah. Yeah. Sorry, you had a question. Yes, a bit. Um, so what the new telescopes that are coming online over the next 10 to 30 years, mm. I'm aware of several of them, which will be powerful enough to see into the atmospheres of the exoplanets that we've identified. Um, my understanding is that we should be able to detect anything from uh, evidence of microbial life, uh, if there's a specific amount of it producing methane or so forth, um, through to also being able to see evidence of advanced societies if they're there. I doubt, but yeah, it's just me. 
I doubt it. You, you, you doubt that it will have the fidelity high yeah. enough to be able to see that? Yeah, because this is really far away. Right. Yeah. I thought that was the purpose of them being built though. Yeah, the, but they're, they're, they're so far away. What we can see, so remember what I was telling you about the live in Pilbara, right? So there was live in Pilbara and then um, how do they know it was live in Pilbara? That's the thing. This is the thing about space sciences and astrobiology. You go there and you look and you can't see any evidence of life, right? Because life is bacteria, it's soft, you know, like this goes away unless there's a bone or there's something of a structure that is solid. You cannot tell that anything has been there. But what they can see is the effect that life had on the rocks. So those rocks are curved. I doubt, and this is just my personal opinion, and I hope I'm wrong, right? That for now, and probably in the future, the things will change, but for now, we will be able to magnify so much to see things there, like to see all those, unless there's this extraterrestrial civilization, in which case, yeah, you would see satellites, you would see comets, you would see what we know. And again, this is like the, the amazing thing about astronomy. Everything we know, we actually know by measuring the light that comes from the stars, nothing else. And, yeah? yeah. I mean, in response to this gentleman's question, what these new telescopes will be able to see better, like the James Lev, for example, yeah. is um, they're more powerful, they can collect more light, mm. so they can actually do much easier spectroscopy. Mm. And that means mm. they can see possible mm markers of life in the atmosphere by looking at the spectrum yeah. of these. But the markers elements. of life are chemical elements. That's all we can see in the universe. Yeah. There's nothing else and we see, yeah. yeah? But there could be a result of yeah. life. Yeah, could be a result. For so example, higher oxygen concentration. Yeah, so that could be, you see that. And you can see, because you can see oxygen in the heart of stars, you can. That's what we do, like currently. We it's just one of those things that you can't say, this is certainly life. Yeah I, yeah, I think it's so far away, like literally, I think it's so far away. We're not yet there with technology, uh, not even James, because the next telescope that's going to be launched is going to be James Webb Telescope, right? And they're going to put it in the like ranch point, which is behind the moon, and it's going to like have like really dark space and cool down to almost zero absolute and stuff like that. But even that, it's not going to be able to see that far away, right? It's, it's not. For, for the sake of argument, which is a separate question, uh, as a thought experiment, let's say that uh, some conclusive result did come back. Uh, do you think, as an astrobiologist, um, but also I suppose looking at it socially, do you think that uh, Earth populations would be um, receptive to this? Do you think it would be chaos, like everyone says? Or do you think um, we're actually ready for it as a global society? I think we're ready for it. I mean, that's a good question. I think we're ready for uh, going further, right? People, I mean, that it's like, I think we have like patches of development in, on Earth, right? So you have people who are really have like, you know, carts and horses and things like that, and they do rudimentary agriculture, and then you have people who do all this amazing research on on the other on the other hand. And uh, but I think the one thing that is going to change the world, and it's already started, like fundamentally change the world, is access to information. And we are curious, right? We are curious, and we have that. I call it spirit because I cannot explain it scientifically. But there is something inside us that is always like striving for us to find out why, to to understand, to is that spirit of of just you know getting the world around you and how it is made. And I think that somewhere, and this is just I'm not a scientist. I'm I'm just talking as someone who you know saw many things. I think that somewhere here there is this subconscious, collective subconscious, right? Which you see like mobs and things like that. There is all these mirror neurons. Neuroscience is, is able to answer more about this, you know, and it, it's again science, not not voodoo stuff. So yeah. Uh, but I think that if we put our attention, this is my experience, my life, what I have done with my life, the reason why I ended up doing this job, the reason why I'm doing these talks today is because I was completely in love with space and I put my attention on how can I do, what can I do to get the job that is doing this kind of stuff, talks and, you know, finding people and, and, 
And I think that if you put your attention sufficiently on something, and we just keep your attention on that thing, doesn't matter what it is, it's going to happen. Doesn't matter what. But if you get distracted by negative stuff and things, then you Oh, excuse me. You put your attention on the negative stuff. Right? And everybody knows this, right? Everybody kind of like more or less knows this. So, so yeah, I, I think that the future, we are making it, but I think those of us who know this, I think we have the the obligation, the moral obligation to go there and tell people, you know, there is no voodoo stuff, there is no design, intelligent design. No, it's everything depends on us to 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 make sure that we're gonna have a better tomorrow. That's what I think. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks again, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, in the next month, uh, we'll probably put an announcement again for another talk. Um, uh, maybe a different topic, uh, too. But, uh, yeah, please check us out at spacebase.co and then also the, the Facebook uh, uh, group, Space uh, Base NZ. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.